Thank you. Um, I'd like first to thank the organizers, uh, especially Juliano, for all the trouble he's gone through inviting me here. Pleasure to be back. Um, I have, uh, first, I have to apologize for the tone because it will be rather different from the other talks I imagined. Um, second, to well give credit to the long list of uh, collaborators on this project, which going on for four years now, almost five. First one is Fabio Novais, it's local boy, it's up there, sitting by the emergency exit. Amilka and Manuela, Amilka probably is known from many of the crowd, and um, the people that have been uh, chipped in more recently, and people from uh, the Imperial College, Darren Rodri, uh, my student Tiago, who's working on part of the things that we're talking about today. Uh, Julian, uh, who's a uh, shared uh, PhD student between uh, myself and Elisabetta at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, Oleg, uh, who's uh, recently joined the CNRS at the Université de Tours. And João Paulo, who's uh, trying to get the things done in the end. So let me try to start by looking at the pedestrian bit. The thing has some bridge problems. And yeah, this side. This thing never works actually the way I want to. So I'll try to, to start with a very uh, easy, well, <sighs> trivial statement really. So suppose that I have some uh, ordinary differential equation that I want to solve. And uh, usually when I talk uh, to kids and the mathematical methods uh, prog uh, course, they'll say, oh, we can use um, Frobenius method and try to get a series solution from that. And then you extend the solution around some uh, singular point, like uh, ZI, what I'm call calling here. And um, this gives a solution, right? And which is uh, converges in some good cases or some non-cases close to ZI, and that's that. Although, um, by providing the solution, you wouldn't be you would be hard pressed to call this a solution of the problem, because usually you don't care about local solutions. What you care about is how the solutions they relate. So especially, and this is the problem I'll be considering here, how solutions that you construct from one particular singular point relate to the solutions that you can construct from the other point. So this is a known problem in mathematics. It has more than 120 years, and it's called the connection problem. And I'm I'm trying to to summarize that in the second, in the first equation here, uh, in which I construct a basis of solution at some particular singular point, and I'll be only considering singular points here, zi, and some other solution which I construct at some other singular point, zj, and the matrix rel relating to two of them is this uh, matrix I'm parameterizing with these constants a, b, c, and d there. They are called the connection matrix. And if I solve the connection matrix, if I find the connection matrix, I can solve many different problems that are usually, uh, uh, well, of interest in physics and mathematics as well. So for instance, I can solve, and I'm, I'm going to discuss this a in a bit more detail, the scattering problem, and I can also solve the eigenvalue problem of the equation. Now, the kind of equations that I'm considering here, they usually they provide two solutions, and the both solutions they have some uh, geometric or some physical interpretation. So if I have some scattering problem which, uh, which is dictated by some second order differential equation, the scattering problem uh, usually have incoming and outgoing waves and they are both linearly independent solutions of the differential equation. And they are related. They are related by some uh, discrete symmetry. I, in the scattering problem, it's usually time reversal. Also, uh, I'm not be considering the generic kind of uh, differential equations that arise, but only the Fuchsian subclass. Uh, which is already important and uh, interesting enough. And the conf uh, confluent limits, uh, I'll be talking about, uh, I'll not be talking about them in great detail here, but they, they are also very important, and uh, we are leaving them for future work. Now, the method to, to solve this problem, to find the, the connection problem, uh, is uh, something uh, we found out a few years ago. It uses the isomonotomy uh, transformation. So I, I'm going to go over that in a bit, in a bit of uh, depth. So uh, first of all, you have a second order differential equation. 
Uh, and we want to study this isomonotropic equation. The way I understand that coming from a high energy physics the background is trying to uh, to formulate the second order differential equations of first order Mercutio system. So in this case, I have this. Uh, I can phrase the second order differential equation in this Mercutio form, and given a set of two solutions, I can arrange them in neatly into uh, columns of a matrix, which I'm calling a fundamental matrix of solutions, uh, phi of z here. And this phi of z defines a holomorphic connection, usually from, I mean, from the usual thing. Uh, you, may, you may be worried about the, uh, this matrix of solution having an inverse here, but uh, this is guaranteed from the fact that the Ronskin of these two linearly independent solutions are, is different from zero. Now, uh, so to sum up, uh, given a set of solutions, we can relate to a flat holomorphic connection. The converse, unfortunately, is not true. Given a flat holomorphic connection, you cannot always have uh, ordinary differential equations associated to it because you can, and usually do, have zeros of the one, two element of the flat holomorphic connection. I'm trying to put it here. A flat holomorphic connection which allows for you to have a, a ordinary differential equation uh, associated to it is called an OPER. And this is not really, I mean, this is something that uh, can be seen to be equivalent to uh, the OPA, usual OPA definition in the flat holomorphic connection uh, literature. Phi, yeah, uh, you arrange neatly the, the solutions, both solutions you have. I should have uh, written them explicitly. But if you have two different solutions, in this case, uh, you have the first derivative here. Uh, this is not really necessary. So this is the wrong cam wrong cam matrix. Yeah, the determinant is different from zero. That allows you to write the, to define the flat holomorphic connection. Um, right, having a flat holomorphic connection means that you have lots of e geometric interpretation for the uh, structure of the function equation. For instance, you can uh, you can find uh, uh, the singular points of the flat holomorphic connection and relate them to charges, to SU two charges in this case, or U two charges actually, and you can also define uh, uh, observables. In this case, you have the holonomy observables, which I'm uh, calling MI, which are just the Wilson lines around each of these charges. They define gauge invariant observables in the in the in the gauge theory language by the usual by the usual construction. Given a, a non-trivial, non-contractible loop, you have uh, the values of the traces of these uh, of these observables. Uh, they define the space of gauge invariant quantities that you can define on this system, and they usually call trace coordinates. I've been told that this is not really uh, scalable. Uh, I'll be dealing mostly with the four-point case here, so uh, this will be, the, uh, the construction will suffice for our needs. Okay, uh, the thing is that the holonomy, this, uh, the traces uh, that you define from the gauge theory, they are really equivalent to the monodromy properties of the, uh, the solutions. And this can be seen easily. Given a, a fundamental matrix of solution, which I'm trying to write in the more generic case here, in which uh, the second uh, row is not necessarily the derivative of the first one. It can be something more general. Then, but uh, given that uh, this uh, equation that you come from this is uh, that you, uh, you define from the, from the fundamental matrix is a Fuchsian, then it's just some rational function uh, rational, uh, well, some combination, uh, why some combination of uh, the first derivative and the zero derivative wi where the coefficients are rational functions. So they have the same monodromy properties. And then the monodromy properties of the y's are, are seen easily from the equation. I'm parameterizing them by this uh, uh, diagonal part, which I'm called alpha. I'm using alpha for something else later on, so I should apologize in, uh, apologize in advance. And the thetas, the thetas, they they come directly from uh, from the actual the, the observable, the trace of the monodromy. In this case, in this particular case, when you have some uh, Frobenius basis at zi, then you can easily compute the monodromy matrix to be diagonal in this case. And I'm oh, I missed a uh, subscript in the alpha here, but uh, th I'm throwing out this u1 part anyway, and just keeping this uh, theta. Right, and this is uh, this gives you the monodromy matrix, and in this case, the monodromy matrix is just given by the 
by this diagonal form because you chose the basis carefully. You chose the basis to be the actual Frobenius basis that you constructed that particular singular point. If you have some other basis, so for instance, a basis that you constructed a different singular point, then you have to do the connection. You have to write them as some uh, linear combination of the first of zi, do the uh, uh, write the monodromy matrix, and then convert it back. So uh, generically, the monodromy matrices they have this uh, um, structure. They have the they depend uh, they depend uh, very deeply on the connection matrix. Right. Okay. So. Since I have this geometric interpretation for the space of parameters on the flat holomorphic connection, uh, these uh, trace coordinates, now I can pose the question that I'm trying to solve here. Does the knowledge of this connection of the uh, observables on the gauge theory determine the connection matrix? If I can determine the connection matrix, I can solve these uh, different interesting problems in physics. So perhaps it's a good thing to, to ask. Well. The answer, I'm spoiling it already, uh, is uh, for a large case, for a large uh, class of, of gauge holomorphic connection, yes, you can solve the, the connection matrix given the monodromy properties. And the class of, uh, of equations that I'm solving, they usually they have some discrete symmetry that relate it, it relates between these two solutions. I'm calling it T, it can be time reversal, uh, and then, uh, in generically, some just some involution of the system, uh, some involution between the solutions. So, just to recap, for instance, when you have the scattering, you have uh, the pair of uh, your uh, functions at each of the singular points, and I'm thinking them in the Riemann sphere, so they may be infinity here. So you have some zi at infinity, some gj at some uh, some other point in in, uh, in the Riemann sphere. And usually the scattering problem is solved by quantum mechanics, for instance, by saying that you have only transmitted wave after the, the, the potential center. And uh, this uh, can be written as a sum of incom uh, incoming and outgoing waves at some other point. If you time reverse this, then you get the other solution at uh, ZI. So you can arrange the connection matrix, which in this case depends exactly on the, on the transmission and the reflection coefficients. In this, in this way, where when you get this uh, 1 over ta t and r over t, you're talking about the incoming wave, and the second column refers to the time-reversed uh, uh, process. Now, uh, this paper in, uh, four years ago, uh, me and, and Fabio, we derived this formula for the transmission coefficient given the monodromy data. In this case, you have, uh, you depends only on this composite monodromy parameter uh, that I'm parameterizing by sigma. I'll be using that a lot in the later part of the talk. And give if you are given that, if you know that, you can, uh, you can write the transmission coefficient uh, directly. Okay. Before getting to the trouble of trying to, to compute it, uh, there's some, some other problem which is not related to scattering that can be done the same way. It's an eigenvalue problem. In the eigenvalue problem, you usually you place conditions that are uh, on one solution that behaves neatly at one singular point and also behaves neatly at the other singular point. So that poses uh, res uh, restrictions on the connection matrix. In this case here, I'm uh, arranging the solution, the fundamental solution, so that the, the connection matrix is lower triangular. That's usually what happens, for instance, when you try to compute uh, spherical harmonics as solutions of the... Uh, Legendre equation in the usual uh, angular momentum theory. Now, uh, the fact that the connection matrix is a lower triangular means that the monodromy matrix between the two of them, they commute. This can be uh, easily checked. Uh, the converse is also true. If the connection matrix commute, then if the monodromy matrix commute, sorry, then the connection matrix is either o lower or upper triangular. So the fact that connection matrix commute also means that they, they can be both uh, diagonalized simultaneously, so the composite monodromy parameter is related to the single monodromy parameters in a very uh, uh, nice way. They are just the sum of them plus an integer because you usually you're talking about the cosine is a bit of the restriction of cosine of these parameters. So now you can uh, try to see if this uh, 
shows to you the quantization. Well, this is a quantization uh, condition, but it may have something else to do than the usual uh, uh, restriction that you have on the solution. The third example, which uh, will introduce me to the problem you I we solved, actually, is classical Liouville theory. So classical Liouville theory has uh, a deep connection to, to flat holomorphic connections. Uh, the usual sense, you do this uh, parameterization of the fundamental matrix in terms of these uh, uh, three fields, in this case, x, phi of c, and x, xl, oh, sorry, chi l and chi r and uh, phi of c, which is called the Liouville profile. The flat holomorphic connection in this case, uh, along with the, with, uh, the open condition, in this case is the usual open condition that uh, uh, the, the connection matrix, the uh, gauge potential can be put in uh, this, uh, uh, can be gauge transformed to this form. And uh, this is translated, well, actually this value here is mu, so this is the open condition. And uh, the flat holomorphic connection uh, condition translates to the classical Liouville equation. And this has a solution, uh, usually I mean it's written in this uh, books, introductory books on, on partial differential equation. The generic solution depends on two uh, analytic functions. But again, you have the same pro problem, I mean it's not actually important what the solution is, but what are the, the properties. And I'm going not going to go over the classical uniformization uh, theory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they, are, they, not even, they don't even need to be related by uh, complex conjugation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and both of them have uh, interesting applications, which I'm going to touch here. But exactly because this uh, carries uh, little information, uh, usually people talk about uh, the stress energy tensor and of Liouville. And this depends on the, on the Schwarzschild derivative of the map that translates between, uh, that gives actually the solution. This is a better way to characterize the solution. And it's known since the Schwarz itself that uh, this condition, which is a third order nonlinear differential equation, can be related to the function of to the, uh, the theory of linear differential equation by uh, doing this uh, substitution when you get the you write the map as a ratio of two analytic functions and this analytic function satisfy a second order uh, linear differential equation now this t of z has uh, interpretation in terms of uh, classical Liouville theory and also has interpretation of conformal field theory which perhaps more uh, better known for people that uh, study integrable systems the class of, uh, uh, of uh, T of Z that I'll be interested in here are the ones that show up in uh, classical uniformization uh, theory. In, uh, I'm talking about the late 19th century. And they are usually determined, the T of Z is usually determined by the second, the double pole and the single pole structure. Now, this is an interesting problem from classical uniformization theory in itself. Because you have lots of symmetry. You have symmetries from the Schwarz, and you have symmetries from um, uh, global conformal transformations. And these symmetries, for instance, uh, you, can, uh, you can try to guarantee that infinity is not a singular point on the, on the ordinary differential equation that poses some restrictions on the, on the parameters of this function t, which are called, well, they're usually called the global, um, global symmetry uh, constriction, uh, restrictions. But uh, the problem that I'm trying to solve here, remember, we need to find these uh, uh, parameters or quantization condition or whatever in terms of geometrical data, the data that can be defined from the flat holomorphic connection. If I'm uh, thinking about the uh, classical uh, uniformization theory that I mean uh, to find a map between some region in the complex plane to some other region, say the upper half plane, which is fiduciary, I don't want to vary that, and the transformation that has to satisfy some uh, geometrical property. Usually, and this is the better, the better thing, uh, I can just draw them in, a, in the plane. So I can just draw. In this case, I can draw a series of uh, 
straight lines, which I'm not drawing here, and uh, circular arcs, which uh, this is a rough uh, approximation to. And they are uh, they have the property that uh, uh, locally at each point, because they are circular arcs or straight lines, they are uh, always analytic. But you have these vertices where the uh, circular arcs they meet, which the function of the map uh, fails to be analytic. These are the singular points of your Fuchsian differential equation. But given the fact that I can actually draw them in a paper, I can uh, not only write the holonomy or the monodromy in uh, geometrical data, I can actually give uh, explici uh, explicit representation of the monodromy matrix. And they are given here. I'm not going to discuss the, the formula. It's just a trivial application of uh, analytic geometry to this, uh, to this figure. But given that I have a specific representation of the monodromy uh, matrices, I also have a specific representation of the monodromy data, the sigmas and the theta. So just to wit, uh, four point case, which is the case I'm going to solve. I have the double pole, the single pole structure, which I, if I'm using that those global uh, constraints, uh, uh, the, the thing that I have to find to is just the accessory parameter K naught here and T naught the uh, pre-image of, uh, of the fourth vertex. The both of them are actually called accessory parameters in the classic uh, uniformization theory literature. Now, the easy part is to find the alphas, and they are easily related to the angles. Actually, th this is just coming from the initial equation of the Frobenius method. There is nothing related to it. Any uh, kindergarten kid can, can solve that, probably. The hard part is to find the accessory parameters in, term in terms of, uh, of the geometrical data that I'm defining here. And the task of finding the, the accessory parameters is made possible by existence of a, a nonlinear symmetry of these equations. Now, in order to implement the nonlinear symmetry, I'm going to uh, rewrite the differential equation, the second order differential equations of first order system matricial system, and because the second order differential equation is Fuchsian with four singular points, I know for a fact that the, ma the matrix of coefficients A of Z here has a partial uh, fraction expansion. So you have a, pole, a, simple a single pole at Z equals zero, equals uh, one, and T. And I, I'm writing here T in a more generic sense. Now, um, the Kyoto School had the idea uh, about uh, 40 years ago almost, uh, to see A of Z as the Z part of a flat holomorphic connection. Not holomorphic in this case, but a gauge field connection, really. And they introduce a T component of this gauge field, which uh, I'm writing here, and demanding that the T component, ha the T and the Z component have uh, zero curvature. Now, this translates, and this is the thing that people knew in mathematics for 100 years now, to the Schlesinger equations. That means that uh, these equations of the matrices A0, 1, and T, they have to satisfy in order that the function that you define from this, uh, uh, from, uh, from the fundamental matrix, actually I didn't write the second condition. If you demand the, the If you demand that the connection that arises from A, uh, A of T and, and A of Z, which is just AZ here, is flat, then it means that uh, there is an, a matrix, a fundamental matrix uh, phi that gives A of T as a function of T and also gives A of Z as a function of Z. The, the equation for Z is just the first one here, except that I'm uh, changing uh, total derivatives to partial derivatives. So I'm seeing T and Z as independent variables. Now, the existence of this matrix phi means that the coefficients that have to satisfy this set of nonlinear differential, the well, first order differential equations, they are called the Schlesinger equations. And the uh, solution of the Schlesinger equations will mean that uh, I can deform now the, the parameter t on the, on the solution of the phi, the fundamental matrix, and uh, the solution will still be analytic. Being analytic means that uh, I will keep the monodromy data invariant. So these are usually called, they are also called the uh, isomonodromy deformation, in the sense that uh, I change t here, the or, some, or some other parameter, in this case t, 
I change T, but the monotony uh, information about the solutions uh, phi is kept invariant. Now, uh, if you deform the theory, you don't get the, the differential equation that you started with. Now you're going to get more stuff. And it's, in, it's interesting to go over that. So you can write easily the, the differential equation. Actually, I, I forgot to change these variables here. But P is a function of z and t, not of w. Also Q. Q. And uh, you see that you basically have the, the, the uh, pole structure that you need for a Fuchsian differential equation, except that you have few extra poles coming from the zeros and the poles of this uh, the one two component of the matrix A. Well, the poles, uh, the pole structure of the matrix uh, of one two just comes from the pole structure of the partial expansion of A. So th there is nothing new there. But uh, usually, when you write this uh, matrices, it's uh, a of z. A of z. It's fairly convenient to write them It's fairly convenient to write them in a way that uh, the first uh, correction when z is very large is diagonal. So the off diagonal terms of the matrix 1 they fall off faster than 1 over z. In this case they can only uh, they'll only fall off as 1 over z squared because everything is rational. So you know for a fact that the, the numerator here is a first order polynomial has only one zero. And I'm calling this zero lambda. So around that time, people also noticed that uh, varying the, the parameter t and uh, allowing the matrices to satisfy Schlesinger equation put some uh, conditions on lambda. The system is actually Hamiltonian. Uh, it, the Hamiltonian structure comes, the symplectic structure comes directly from the symplectic structure of flat holomorphic connections. And the equation that you, the second order equation that you get from lambda, actually lambda and mu here, this, uh, which is this, uh, forgot to change here as well, which is the, the pole, the residue of the uh, first uh, one one uh, entry of the matrix A at uh, lambda, as equals lambda. Uh, they are double connections of this symplectic system. And then you can write uh, the uh, Hamiltonian system associated to it is called the Garnier system. And the second order equation uh, satisfied by the, the zero of this A12 is actually the, the sixth point level transcendent. So um, the Kyoto School Jimbo uh, wrote a very beautiful paper on uh, how to extract the asymptotic structure of uh, the solution of the point level equation in terms of monodromy data. So it's exactly the kind of thing that we need. I mean, we, well, the things that we know. So the question that remains now is just how to translate the ordinary differential equation that we want to solve into this generic uh, uh, isomonodromy setting. And this is also easily done because uh, you want the uh, extra pole here, uh, lambda, not to exist. And because a Poinlevé uh, solution has uh, essential singularities at 0 and 1, it's uh, fairly natural to choose a lambda equals t as some initial condition of your Hamiltonian system. Uh, given that uh, you have this restriction between uh, lambda t and mu here from the second line, then it also sets the value for mu. So you have the uh, set of initial conditions for the Hamiltonian system here, and you are good to go. You could, in, uh, at this point, you could just solve the, the, the differential equation, the point level differential equation, but this is uh, usually hard to do. Uh, fortunately, we have... Uh, we have uh, uh, the Kyoto School to, to thank for a uh, asymptotic expression, expansion for tau, which can, could, in principle, be computed recursively. There is uh, uh, a way to do that uh, computationally speaking. But in order to embed the differential equation that you want to do, you need to set lambda equals t and mu equals uh, so some value in order for the, the Hamiltonian to be well-defined. 
this translates to the tau function that uh, the Nibo, uh, Jimbo, Mio, and Weno and collaborators uh, de uh, defined in the 80s by these two conditions here. So I'm going to go over them, uh, if time permits, uh, a bit more carefully. But the first condition just gives the this accessory parameter k0 as uh, the uh, derivative of a log of tau, the first derivative, which terms here that just cancel, plus this extra stuff, which is uh, it can be easily seen to be constant under Schlesinger motion. And the second uh, condition is a bit trickier because it doesn't depend on the accessory parameters. So there's something to be understood here. Now, the second condition is the easiest thing to do because uh, you can read up the paper by Okamoto on the sixth point of transcendent, and you can find easily that the second derivative of the tau function is related to the tau function itself by doing uh, what he calls a Schlesinger, what uh, Jimbo, Miwa, and Weno call a Schlesinger transformation. It's just uh, you multiply your solution by z minus t, and then you add a uh, monodromy unit to the z equals t, a singular pole, you subtract one at infinity, or vice versa. You can also divide the solution by z. So this is what I've done here in order to construct a solution, uh, a solution uh, which I'm called phi plus here, and just getting the solution here and multiplying it by this matrix. So I'm adding a value of monodromy at z equals t, but also subtracting a value of monodromy at infinity. Or I can do the other way around. In this case here, I'm subtracting the value z over t. There is an overall factor of z minus t as well. And adding at infinity. Given, uh, I don't know them explicitly, but if I know phi of z, I know phi plus and phi minus. Now, uh, I can try to define tau functions for each one of them. And uh, through some labor, I arrived at this uh, equation that Toda defines as, uh, Elkamoto defines as the Toda equation, which relates, uh, which relates to the second derivative of the tau function to this uh, ratio of products of tau functions. Tau plus is the tau function associated to phi plus and tau minus to phi minus. Now, the second, the, the left hand side there is exactly the condition that I had for zero of for the second derivative of the tau function here. This one. If you place this to the other side, you find that the product that you define here on the on the right hand side of the total equation is zero. If you do a more careful analysis, and this is also uh, some pain, I'm not going to show it explicitly unless uh, tortured, I find that the zero that I'm looking for is of tau plus. And actually, this is the only thing that selects the first line over the second line. You see that the all when I try to embed this in this geometric setting, I lose track of what I mean by the solution of the system because the all entries are treated in basically the same respect. The only thing that selects the first line over the second line, say, is uh, the fact that I'm selecting tau plus and not pi mi tau minus. So I can rephrase the conditions in this slightly more elegant way in which the condition for me to have this uh, ordinary differential equation is just a zero of the Miwa Gimbo Weno tau function. And now I can uh, talk about the first condition as well because uh, this is a uh, this is the usual uh, uh, classical mechanics Hamiltonian system, and there is a way to solve a classical mechanics Hamiltonian system, which only one, which, well, with only one degree of freedom by using Hamilton-Jacobi theory. So this basically is means that uh, there is a uh, you can think of t and k as some Dabu coordinates on this uh, space of parameters. They actually there are double coordinates of the space of flat column of connection. And the first line just gives the canonical transformation between k and t and the monodromy parameters under which, I mean the space of which the evolution, the isomonodromy of evolution is obviously trivial. I mean it doesn't change it. So the solution of the equations of motion is just p equals constant and q equals constant. So the log of tau in this sense is just the uh, uh, Hamilton Jacobi solution. Just the, the solution, uh, the canonical transformation that gives you the, 
the transformation between the variables, dynamical variables of the system and some other systems in which the dynamic is true. But now let me just uh, pause for a minute before do going for the applications themselves. Um, zero of the tau function means that uh, I have this uh, first order differ uh, ordinary differential equation, which is a uh, Fuchsian system, in this case with four singular points. Uh, this gives a, a significance to the zeros of the uh, tau function. I'm going to talk about, about that later on. The associated uh, tau function, the one that which I had uh, with these other parameters here, because this is basically tau plus, this is what I call tau plus there, and this is tau that I defined before. And this gives just the, the hamilton zarkovsky solution that allows you to solve the system, uh, in this case, given an implicit solution. Uh, you can find the accessory parameters. There is a procedure now to find the accessory parameters. Just uh, uh, use uh, whatever means you have to write the tau function and then differentiate that with respect to the isomonotomy time and you find the accessory parameter. And here you have to find four zeros of it, of this associated one. Actually, in the sake of um, uh, uh, statics, I should probably call this is the tau function associated to the system, and this is the associated one, because it's ugly. Now, there are ways to do that now, of course, to find the tau function. You can either solve the point level equation, so it's a point level equation in the sigma form, or you can find uh, uh, a, a systematic way to write the expansion. This has been done by um, these two papers here. The first one is by Gamayu, Yorgov, and Lisovi in 2013. That's given in terms of Nekrasov functions, and uh, fairly new development in usual Riemann Hilbert style by Gavrilenko and Lisov in 2016. It gives you the expansion as a fred home determinant. Now, the Nekrasov uh, expansion uh, has deep ties to conformal blocks, and probably people here are more suited to talk about that than I am. But uh, the tau function can be seen as this uh, particular correlation function of CFT in which you have two primaries, one sitting at zero and one at t, with uh, conformal weights given by this alpha parameters, well, as a function of the alpha parameters I introduced late earlier. And the composite monodromy given by this uh, projection operator on, this on the Verma module uh, uh, created by the, by the conformal primary with uh, conformal dimension related by si the sigma parameter. And if you can compute that, it could, in principle, give, a, give an expansion to for the tau function. Uh, this has been uh, introduced, I think, the first time by Zamolochkov in the end of the 80s. And he gave in the paper a expansion, well, a recursion relation for the coefficients of the expansion. Now, uh, I have to be uh, more cavalier about this. Uh, new developments that allow me to, to write the, the function, uh, AGT conjecture, and uh, uh, Nekrasov instanton uh, for n equals to supersymmetric. No? C is the central charge. Uh -huh. So actually they found out that uh, the expansion, the Nekrasov instanton partition function satisfies the point level S6 with C equals 1, when the Nekrasov, when the expansion has C equals 1. Now this gives a double expansion of the tau function near 0. Or you can, uh, can easily do that near 1 and infinity. And this is given by this whole set of data here, which I'm not talking about because I don't have time. Now, uh, we can use that to solve for Liouville maps, or classical construct uh, solutions for the classical Liouville equation. In the uniformization procedure, it gives, uh, this means giving this geometrical region a, uh, a map that uh, solves Liouville equation, so gives a, uh, defines a metric on this, uh, s uh, on this system which has negative constant curvature. Now, this is a, uh, to find the accessory parameters here is the real hard problem. This can be using the, the construction I had before. The solution can be translated to a Fuchsian differential equation. In this case, uh, uh, the f you have four singular points as well. Uh, infinity, zero, one, and the other uh, infinity there. Yeah, this is the complex plane. So this is just a, so and this set of streamlines are uh, this is the usual thing that peop these people want to obtain. So in this case, um, you can find, uh, you can parameterize the pre-vertex by uh, this value of the height of the circular bump in the middle. And uh, this uh, relates directly to the, to the composite monotomy parameter, which I'm calling sigma here. 
and you can give the, the, the accessor parameters t, the zero of the tau function, and the accessor parameter k as uh, asymptotic expansions. I, I'm just uh, writing the first term here. And because in this particular case, for instance, when h, h equals 2, so means that the height is commensurate with the bump, the you find out that the value for t, t naught is actually very small. So this uh, is a very good approximation. Even when t naught is not a very good approximation, when t naught is large, when this is not a very good approximation, we found out just, just this method of uh, expanding the Nekrasov function is as good as the usual old-fashioned uh, hunting that these people do for the accessory parameters. They usually they they give guesses for the accessory parameters that you have the the, the region itself. And this is this uh, work that can just be accepted to proceedings uh, by uh, with Tiago. Uh yeah, it's uh, no, it's just proceedings of Royal Society. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we have this problem in Brazil that if I, yeah, sorry, the A, so on. I'm sorry about that. But uh, this is the thing, I mean, I cannot submit to papers in, in mathematics, otherwise my student would get a job. <laughs> and uh, probably I wouldn't get a, a fellowship either. Uh, so I'm just showing you uh, some other region here. Uh, for instance, this uh, uh, domain that's uh, specified by these four circles. Uh, this also has the same properties. You can compute numerically the the, uh, the monotony parameters and uh, the J here is just a check. And then uh, you see that this method here already uh, gives you a better, uh, even with T0 uh, somewhat large, gives you a better approximation than the, well, gives you a different approximation than the usual method. It's, it's better as well. Yeah, I didn't plug it because I'm stupid. Sorry. Now, uh, I would like at this point to, to conjecture that, okay, if I have a zero of the tau function between zero and one, I can uh, find the system. And usually, it, can it has to be a real zero because I'm mapping the region to the upper half plane. And T not gives the position of the pure vertex. And this is an old problem that Tartayan has uh, done some work uh, uh, 20 years ago. But uh, it's also an interesting problem because uh, I would like this point to say, okay, I have to find a zero, and there is only one zero, so I'm done with it. But in fact, this is not true. But the fact that there is extra zeros is actually interesting. So I'll just go over this a little bit before my time runs out. Uh, if you follow, you find another zero in this case, which is very close to zero. Find another root which is very close to zero. Uh, <laughs> right. I, remember that this region here has a root where t naught is 0.2. But you will also find another root. I, I was advised not to use the word root because of uh, connections to SL2. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you, ha you find another root which is very close to zero, this one, that the old method couldn't see because it was just not accurate enough. So you could, uh, could try to uh, your know, MATLAB skills and try to plot the region that arises from this new one. And the region is very funny because the region that uh, we are looking for is this region between the intersection bet of the four circles here. It's this uh, quadrangle here. But it, and so it should work that if you follow the real line in the, in the, in the pre-image plane, and then you integrate the system, you'll find this quadrangle in the complex plane. But as you go on the real line with this new route, uh, this is what happens with the route at 0 0.2. But with the new route now, you, something funny happens, that instead of, uh, for instance, when you jump from one singular point to the next, here, you go as uh, prescribed. You just go here and then this point. But uh, in this point, when you try to follow for the next one, you go, you show overshoot, you go around the circle, and then you continue your trip. It's just in this case, it would take an infinite amount of t to continue. But, and so you, by numeric integration, just see half of it. But you have this sort of uh, isomonodromic region, which is equivalent to the other one. It's just that it goes to the next list of solutions. It would be interesting to have more grasp on that, but uh, so far I can only present you the numerical evidence. Now, let me go over very quickly to the second example, which was the original motivation for the whole uh, shebang. Uh, to study quasi-normal modes on ADS black holes, which is something that probably not many people here would talk about, but, well, anyway, uh, I guess you can understand easily the, that you have a black hole, 
you can think of a black hole as a black box, and you have some fluctuations of the black hole. So in this case, you have metric fluctuations. Metric fluctuations uh, can be decomposed. It's spin two can be decomposed spin one fluctuations, spin zero the fluctuations. Usually, in uh, when people are trying to look at these fluctuations for say in LIGO, they don't care about the spin one and zero because they are gauge artifacts. But in cases like ADS-CFT, they are actually physically relevant. So, in this case, and uh, which was the uh, the first case that we considered, uh, we'll be looking uh, for a scalar which is the simpler one, uh, resonances. And uh, quasi-normal modes are just these resonances between uh, the black hole and the surrounding ambient. In ADS-5, ADS you can think of ADS-5 as a sort of a box, so they are really like uh, standing waves in tubes or things like that. This is work we've done with uh, Julian and Palante. It's built on, on different work we've done with uh, Fabio a few years ago. And, but this one is actually simpler. If I knew that, I could get even Fabio the job, but I didn't. So there. Now, uh, in order to do that, we need some. F uh, the problem is slightly more difficult than the one that we had before, just to find the zero of the tau function. This one we have to actually solve it implicitly, because the parameters depend on physical quantities. So I'm going to introduce this. Uh, uh, the other uh, expansion of the tau function is given I as a Fred Holm determinant. Exactly. They are integral operators. Uh, this has been done uh, recently by Lisov and Gravi uh, Gavrilenko. Um, it's actually uh, a better way to compute it because as a determinant, well, it's a, just the same way as the Gaussian unitary ensemble. It converges very fast, much faster than the Nekrasov expression, which takes exponential time to compute each coefficient. So uh, this is it here. The, these operators A and D, they are given by this um, uh, Parametrices in terms of these parametrices, which are written in terms of uh, uh, Gauss uh, hypergeometric functions, is just a way to uh, to implement the monodromy uh, between zero t and infinity, and between one infinity and t and and the intermediate channel separately. And these operators A and D can be just see a plane as a projection operator between the functions that have uh, this monodromy uh, property. I'm not going to embarrass myself trying to explain it more. So now the problem that we want to solve is the scalar field in ADS-5. So you have a, a partial differential equation to solve that can be separable into two ordinary differential equations. And let me deal with the angular equation first. The angular equation is a Hoyne equation, has four singular points, regular singular points. And the position of the uh, singular points is known in terms of the black hole parameters. That's all you need to know. The parameters alpha, the ones that gives the, the double pole uh, structure, they are also known from the differential equation. And in this case, also the, uh, the accessory parameter. The accessory parameter depends on the uh, separation constant, which I'm calling lambda here. It's just a way to define that. You can absorb terms here, but I didn't do that. And what you need to do now is you need to find a solution for that. You need to find values for the accessory parameters in which the solution is regular at both the south and the north pole. That translates to uh, zero and u naught there. Exactly. So you don't have uh, you don't have uh, a a complex angles or things like that. So or, or the or the spherical harmonic blowing up at either point. So you need you you can translate that constraint into in terms of monodromy data by using this expression here, that the compositive monodromy parameter is the monodromy is uh, commute because the connection matrix is lower triangular, so you don't mix this solution which doesn't uh, blow up with this solution that does, and that means that the monodromy uh, matrix is commute. That means that the the compositive monodromy parameter is given by the sum of the single plus an integer. Yep, uh, this case, uh, even. And then you can use the generic expression that uh, given in this term, just the uh, Nekrasov uh, expansion suffices to give the separation constant in terms of this L here, which is just the left-hand side. I didn't uh, define it here, but just this uh, uh, the sum here. And this is what uh, people done in the ADS Sferodau literature. It's uh, 15, 25 pages full of calculations that we can easily solve in two or three lines of work here. 
Now, the really uh, good thing, uh, well, the really important bit is to deal with the radial equation, because in this case, the accessory parameter has some, uh, uh, well, has a complex structure. So you cannot use uh, uh, complex conjugation in order to define par uh, operators which are positive definite. So you don't have bounds or anything like that. You have to work more algebraically. And in this case, you can translate the, the existence of normal modes so you, you don't have any flux of energy at, at the outer horizon of the black hole in infinity as, again, a condition on the, on the composite monodromy. Delta is the, uh, it's better to write this in terms of the ADS-CFT language. So delta is the, uh, the dimension of the boundary operator. Uh, that's related to the mass. It's a simple function of the mass. So, yeah, this is related to the mass here. I, I'm out of time, so I'll be very brief. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we, we can use the Plow function. There is a way to relate, the, not to, talk to make the talk too schizophrenic. I can relate to both problems. The existence of, uh, of normal modes uh, can be cast in terms of Liouville field theory. It just in this term, you have, uh, you have not only uh, cusps as the, this uh, vertices, but you also have uh, uh, what I call uh, hyperbolic uh, boundaries. The hyperbolic boundaries are actually related to the physical, uh, physical, um, to the physical horizons, R plus and R minus. And the entropy intake gives you the Liouville momentum around those. Uh, I, can, I can go over that more with more. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There is an extra singular point in this case which I'm not clear about. But the go to the punchline. Uh, we can compute the, the numerically by using the, the, the Fred Home determinant, and uh, you get very good agreement. This is a just test bad case for Schwarzschild zero angular momentum, so I'm not talk, uh, talking about the problem in full generality. But you have very good agreement with the numerical matching that is usually done, and they call it Frobenius for some reason and the discretization method that uh, people usually do. Uh, you can talk to the Portuguese people about that. They know a lot about this. And you can also solve for a uh, generic case. I, we presented the solution just for uh, uh, this uh, A1 and A2, which are rotation parameters of the black hole when they are very close together. This is actually relevant for super radiance, but this is something we haven't done yet. But anyway, let me try to wrap up. Uh, Sorry about the later part, it's a work in progress. We have two numerical implementations for the tau functions that are very useful, both of them, the Fred Holm and the Nekrasov. The only difference is that the Nekrasov, for higher order, it, uh, it takes an exponential time to be computed. So it's not really uh, useful for that. But uh, you have the Fred Holm determinant, which uh, converges very fast, even in the by code, uh, when coded by amateur programmers like ourselves. Uh, we found the connection the solution for the connection problem for Hoyne equation for a large class, an uh, important subclass of equations. Uh, it seems solved. It, seem can be, it can be solved generically, but uh, since we are worried about physics, we didn't uh, go there. Uh, I, I, I think that this new significance of this uh, geometric interpretation of the zero tau function is something new that people didn't know before. We haven't proved anything, but I think we've given good uh, numerical uh, evidence for that. And now you can ask about what happens when there has the referee's head, what happens when it had higher number of points, real zeros, uh, recursion relations, etc. Just a uh, last slide, sorry, Luis. Uh, this is the best, find to f uh, best shot to find super radiant mode because uh, we have so much accuracy. We can usually the people have to, to give uh, numerical evidence to up to 15 orders, so 15 decimal places, when you don't really trust numerics anymore. But in this case, you have good analytical grasp on the, on the expansion. So uh, if there is any super radiant mode on, on the ADS-5 black hole, we'll find it or not. Uh, there is some more ADS-CFT applications uh, for, from basically everything which I haven't talked about here. There is not, uh, to my mind, there, is, uh, there isn't a very clear way to try to, un a, to understand the expansion in terms of total function in terms of ADS-CFT, I mean, given as a sum of Witten diagrams and so on. We tried to do that with Monica Guica from, uh, from Saclair last uh, two years ago and didn't work so well uh, for BTZ, which should be the simpler case. Uh, the radio and the angular system have this uh, the uh, separation constant related. They are equal. 
And the separation constant, as I told you, is just given by the log derivative of the, of the tau function. So you have something akin to log derivative being the partition function of some system, and the potential coming from this partition function between the two, the radio and the angular system, to be equal. That points to some thermodynamic interpretation of uh, this particular system, which we didn't go too well. Well, we didn't go, uh, we didn't uh, explore yet. Uh, higher modes is something that's uh, very important because the way the expansion is done, at least in the Nekrasov, uh, well, in the, the Fred Home determinant way, the way it's done, it's, uh, it's uh, blind over shifts of the 2 pi of the uh, monotony parameters. So, and this is something you need to do in order to solve for the upper uh, uh, super radiant modes. We get the first one, which is already very important because uh, it's, well, it's the most important one because for with that you can understand stability. But we would like also to, to give the, the next. We have to understand more the analytical properties of the top function. There's a whole story which I haven't touched here from the confluent limit, which gives point level f5. Uh, the same story, but uh, point of f5 tau function, and it works beautifully. We can use that for quantizing the Rabi model, which probably was the way that Juliano heard of us. And but you can also do that to do uh, astrophysical applications because with that you can solve the Kerr quasi-normal modes, which is the thing that LIGO measures. Okay, thank you. Sorry about the right. Uh, big thanks to the sponsors. <laughs>